Cosmetic surgery was a $16 billion industry in 2016. Today's guest says the explosive growth in cosmetic procedures is an outgrowth of deregulation in the healthcare industry, and it's affecting the way we think about aging. She's Abigail Brooks this week on Story in the Public Square. Welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host from the Providence Journal, G. Wayne Miller. Each week, we welcome storytellers and scholars to help us make sense of the narratives shaping American public life. This week, we welcome a scholar exploring what it means to age in the United States. Abigail Brooks is Assistant Professor of Sociology and Director of the Women's Studies Program at Providence College. She's also the author of The Ways Women Age, Using and Refusing Cosmetic Intervention. Abigail, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. So what is the story that we tell about aging and beauty in the United States today? Wow, that's a big know, question <laughs> and a complex one, absolutely. But you know, part of why I was interested in doing this work, I interviewed women who um, describe themselves as growing older naturally and women who are subscribing to various forms of cosmetic anti-aging procedures, technologies, etc. One of the reasons that I was interested in talking to everyday women about growing older today in the United States is really to do uh, with a lot of the contextual backdrop um, that these women are growing older within. Um, so we have, you know, an environment where where women are being directly marketed to uh, for the first time with new cosmetic procedures and technologies. Um, this has been true since 1997 um, when direct-to-consumer advertising became legal in the United States for pharmaceuticals and for medical products and procedures. Um, we have an environment where um, new technologies um, and sort of technological intervention um, make cosmetic procedures um, more accessible, more user-friendly, uh, less invasive. Um, so that's also an environment that women are growing older um, within. Um, we're in an increasingly visual culture. <laughs> so more and more and more of our identity is mediated vis-a-vis -vis the screens. Um, and so we're increasingly consumed with our bodies and with how our bodies look, right? Um, social media, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, all of this is going on, um, you know, in creating an environment where cosmetic anti-aging intervention, which is what I'm interested in, um, becomes increasingly normalized, increasingly approved of, acceptable. We know that more than half of Americans now approve of cosmetic intervention. Around 67, 68 percent say if they have intervention, they won't be ashamed to tell people about it, um, to share the fact that they've had intervention. And that's a flip. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yep. So this normalization of um, cosmetic intervention, this increasing acceptance and approval of it, um, kind of as normative behavior, that's part, you know, a big part of the contextual backdrop that I was interested in um, exploring in the sense of, well, how does this affect how women feel about growing older, you know, um, in 2017? You know, is, is it harder? Is it easier? Um, you know, how and in what ways um, did these kind of, um, uh, you know, these factors um, interact with, with their lived experiences of aging as women? So do all of these technologies, and you know, you mentioned advertising, which of course is a very yes. powerful way to tell a story of any kind. Yes. Do these create a desire in, in women, and I guess yeah. also to an yeah. extent men, or do they meet a desire that was already there, or is it yeah. kind of a combination yeah. of both? Such a great question, such a great question. Yeah, I think it's a combination of both. I mean, you know, growing older, um, has always been harder for women than men, particularly in terms of aesthetic changes in the face and the body, signs of aging um, on the face and the body, because women, you know, historically um, in our nation state certainly have been valued um, as a sex object, as a sexually desirable um, object, which is very much centered around youthful beauty and also as a reproductive vessel, right, as somebody who can produce children, um, that those have been arenas of, of key value for women socially and culturally and individually. So certainly 
certainly that's always been true. But what's interesting about this era um, is that the direct-to-consumer marketing of pharmaceuticals, um, the ways in which you see signage um, for cosmetic procedures in your primary care doctor's office, in your gynecologist's office, um, all of this advertising and marketing is playing off of those sentiments, right, in ways um, that make women, um, I think my, my book argues, increasingly vulnerable to valuing themselves in the context of how they look, for example, and in the context of um, not want and not wanting to look older. Um, so I think that um, the increasing availability and normalization of intervention for women, cosmetic intervention, um, actually reinforces and reinscribes, in my view. Um, attitudes about women I would want to trouble over, attitudes wherein women are sort of regressing to valuing themselves vis-a-vis -vis how they look, vis-a-vis -vis, um, how young they look, et cetera. So I Wait. think it's a both and, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and yeah. there's a superficiality yes. about that. Yes. I mean, that, that, that sort of hides or disguises or, or doesn't reveal what is truly the essence of a human being and, or of a woman in, in, the, in the case of this conversation. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And the, and the, and the, um, the, you know, the kind of exposure that women have vis-a-vis -vis media coverage to these new procedures, technologies, vis-a-vis -vis advertising is so savvy. Um, you know, it pulls up tropes of second wave feminism, liberal feminism, radical feminism, and other, you know, really um, sort of key aspects of, um, you know, belief sets, ideologies about what it means to be an American. You know, these things like the self-made individual, you know, freedom of choice, right? Um, individual self-esteem building and empowerment. Um, you know, all the freedom of expression, right? These are all, all ways in which advertising is um, sort of framing cosmetic intervention as a positive choice for women. So women are having to negotiate um, this environment. Um, and one thing, just to follow up on, on your question as well, um, is that it? what I found is that it makes Hard, it makes it harder for women to grow older naturally and feel okay about it, right? Um, because they could say yes to these technologies, they're being bombarded with them, they're increasingly accessible, um, the narratives around the marketing are increasingly savvy. Um, so women who want to grow older without intervention are increasingly feeling either stigmatized because they're looking older and more and more women aren't looking older or mentally because these procedures are increasingly available and accessible, so sort of from a common sense perspective, how can they justify saying no, if, which is interesting. Am I yeah. right in thinking that that yeah. too is a flip? That it, it seems, and yes. I'm, I don't, yeah. I'm, I'm old enough to remember a time yes. when uh, if someone had a little work done, that was almost yeah. scandalous. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and that's you know one of the the things that I trace in my book and my earlier research looks at these processes uh, whereby cosmetic intervention became increasingly approved of, became increasingly normalized. You know, and it's really you know since the late 1990s that we begin to see this shift. And you know there are a lot of different factors going on. I mean, part of it is really reflective of the overarching commercialization of American medicine, right? Wherein we have privatization, deregulation, uh, wherein we have <clears throat> these kinds of procedures, um, you know, being framed as medically legitimate, um, being advertised by doctors. So, you know, um, there's a lot going on there in terms of different contributing factors. Um, but absolutely, it is, it is a new phenomenon. There's less and less stigma associated with intervention. In fact, based on my data, you know, I might kind of um, hypothesize that um, there may be or we're approaching an era where women feel more stigma around saying no than saying yes, right? So that's also really interesting. You know, and that may not be in all circles, in all environments, in all geographies, but it was a sentiment that women articulated to me um, in, in multiple ways, um, in, in really interesting ways. It, it seems like there's an economic factor here too. You yeah. used the word scandalous. We're yes. going back decades yes. to yes. have work yes. done. It was yes. scandalous. Yes. It also was really the purview of people of wealth yes. who yes. would have plastic surgery, and, and not everyone in that in that class, of course, did that. Yeah. Now you can get plans. Exactly. You can have installment yep. payments for your surgery. You can exactly. And I'm guessing the cost of certain procedures have come down. 
Has that been a factor too, or, or am I just reading that no, wrong? No, no, you're absolutely, absolutely right. Um, payment plans for cosmetic procedures have become increasingly common. Um, it's also true that if you get something like Botox injections every three months, or you know, Juvederm or or Dyspor injections, um, and not full-blown surgery, that's you know, three to five hundred under dollars, um, you know, every every three to six months. Whereas you know, you're looking at five to ten to fifteen thousand dollars for a surgical procedure. So these cosmetic Technologies that are non-surgical in some ways are more affordable, although you know they're you know expected to be engaged in throughout the life course. So you can think of it um, in ways in which it's not not so affordable from that perspective. But absolutely, more and more people of varying ranges of socioeconomic backgrounds are having intervention. In fact. Um, you know, a good number of the women I spoke with who are saying yes to intervention um, are on payment plans. You know, some have gone into serious debt around procedures, wow. um, actually leaving the U United States and going elsewhere where they can get more affordable procedures. You know, cosmetic surgery tourism is booming um, is globally really? right now. Absolutely, absolutely. This is yes. the, the American Society of Plastic Surgeons yeah. said earlier this year that it's a 16 billion, yes. billion with a B. Yep dollar industry yeah, in the United States. 2016, yeah. it's, it's the most ever, the most so, ever that Americans have spent. This, yeah. But this doesn't just happen to Wayne's point <laughs> if it's, if it's yeah. uh, the, the, the wealthy. Right. Yeah. This is a, a consumer-driven yeah. mass market now. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. It's not just the wealthy, and certainly internationally and globally. If you want to look in, you know, Latin America, Southeast Asia, outside the United States, you also see that across socioeconomic positionings, um, individuals more and more and more subscribing to cosmetic intervention. In fact, Brazil, you know, beats out the United States um, as the, you know, the cosmetic surgery nation of, of of the globe right now. So, absolutely becoming much, much more, much more uh, normalized uh, uh, procedure process that everyday folk are aware of, are considering, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I think there are two other factors yeah. here that probably amplify this yeah. as well, and, and one is social media. Yes, absolutely. And the second would be Hollywood films and, and television. Have, mm -hmm. have you explored <laughs> that too? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about visual culture, and I see this with my students. You know, I teach, you know, I teach college-age students. My, my, my book here um, is about, you know, women um, from mid-40s to mid-70s. Um, but absolutely more and more and more of how our identity is, is constructed, you know, how we, um, understand ourselves it's happening in two-dimensional space right mm -hmm. um, so in and through the screen so so much of what we're projecting to the world and to ourselves is that two-dimensional image right really is how we look right so we're in an era where aesthetics more than ever are interacting with and informing how we define ourselves so that is really really important and certainly media the entertainment industry I mean that was something that came up so much in my in my interviews mm. and you know we, we're we, we're so exposed to media every day now social media you know you could be you know you could be following Kim Kardashian's Instagram you can be you know you can be following you know Facebook feeds and, and such you're there's this kind of democratization of access to celebrity right that we see in our current social media culture uh, but the ways in which that plays into women feeling anxiety about how they look and about looking older um, is a key theme, ab absolutely key theme um, in, in my book. And, you know, over and over again, I heard from women who are defining themselves as growing older naturally and trying to resist um, the interventive route. I heard over and over from them about how they wished there were more models um, of women in Hollywood growing older naturally, right? Women in their 60s and their 70s and 80s who actually had signs of aging on their faces, who actually had wrinkles and gray hair, et cetera. So they felt like there was, there was an invisibility of women, sort of 40 and older, but then the women who are present and who are actively engaged um, in continuing to have roles in Hollywood and film and television um, are all young looking because they've all had cosmetic intervention. So it's sort of like an interesting question, right? Is it, is it is it progress from a feminist perspective that we have Nicole Kidman just turned 50, you know, still gar garnering pretty key roles? Yes, she's moving into television as well. And we look at other people that knew the new series with, um, you know, with Susan Sarandon and Jessica Lange or, you know, Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin. So we see these women, you know, in their 50s, 60s and 70s now increasingly represented, particularly in television. Television's a bit of a friendlier space uh, for women age 40 mm. and older than film. But all these women look, um, um, you know, somewhere between 35 and 48, and they've all had so much work done. So I don't know, you know, is that progress, yes or no, in terms of, um, you know, gender equality, in terms of 
seeing role models who are um, who are not you know 25 who we can aspire to. So it's really interesting question. Let, let me take a quick moment for station yes. identification. This is Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. You can hear an audio version of this show three times every weekend on the POTUS channel. That's channel 124 on the Sirius XM satellite radio dial. Our show is produced each week by a tremendous crew at the studios of Rhode Island PBS in beautiful Providence, Rhode Island. I'm Jim Lutis, Executive Director of the Pell Center at Salve Regina University in Newport, Rhode Island. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do that at J.M. Lutis. My co-host is an award-winning journalist with the Providence Journal and the author of 17 books, soon to be 17 books. He's G. Wayne Miller, and he's tweeting at G. Wayne Miller. Our guest this week is Abigail Brooks, a sociologist teaching at Providence College, Go Friars, and the author of The Ways Women Age, Using and Refusing Cosmetic Intervention. So, uh, Abigail, you used a, 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 a ten-letter phrase uh, at, the, at the top of the show, mm -hmm. direct to consumer advertising, mm -hmm. to talk mm -hmm. about a shift in the mid-90s mm -hmm. about how mid to late 90s. Uh, medical procedures are marketed yeah to consumers exactly for the audience yes. explain what that yeah. means absolutely absolutely well I think for a lot of um, you know like my college age students and such they may not remember any other environment other than you know turning on the television and being bombarded with advertisements for pharmaceutical drugs etc um, but again this is relatively new and the United States is one of only three nation states where direct to consumer advertising of pharmaceuticals is legal for instance um, so in 1997 that's when we first started seeing all of this um, marketing this advertising um, which really is as much about um, selling treatments for conditions as it is about educating us and teaching us about the illnesses <clears throat> themselves, right? So as consumers, as citizens, we're increasingly learning about health and illness vis-a-vis -vis private industry, right? Vis-a-vis -vis the pharmaceutical industries. But absolutely, that was part of a, a, a long process of deregulating American medicine that started in the late 1970s. Really, it was the Federal Trade Commission mm -hmm. um, that challenged the American Medical Association's um, right to to regulate advertising, um, to try and um, control and regulate advertising of individual um, uh, medical services, practitioner services, et cetera. Um, and the AMA lost in court, and then the federal, the, sorry, the Supreme Court has continued to uphold these FTC mandates that keep coming down. So this happened throughout the 80s, following 1979, and then throughout the 90s. So we now have an environment, again, where direct-to-consumer pharmaceutical advertising is legal, where individual practitioners can legally advertise, right, their services. You probably see some of those on local uh, Providence television for different plastic surgeons, uh, for medical practitioners in general. Right? It's not just exclusive to cosmetic intervention, but it really provided a fertile environment for the cosmetic industry, right? Because those were elective procedures. And if they can be directly marketed to consumers and sort of um, given a bit of a tone of medical legitimacy, that really helps, right? With bringing normalization to them, with bringing acceptability to what was perceived, as you said, you know, before that is being frivolous, right, or superficial, or something you maybe wanted to keep to yourself. So this is why, so when I go to my dermatologist, I'm not yeah. going to the dermatologist's office anymore. I'm going to the cosmetic dermatology exactly, appointment. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, it's very, very, very interesting because there's increasing legitimacy around engaging in procedures um, and thinking about aspects of our bodies that, you know, maybe 35, 40 years ago we would have perceived as silly or superficial or not necessary. Absolutely, yeah. So you teach young women among yes, young yes, men. Do yes. you find talking to them and, and getting to know them yes. that the pressure to maintain this image of youth, yep. regardless of how old you happen to live to, starts young? I mean, in childhood, I'm, I'm thinking of sort of the, yes. the stereotypical Barbie. Yes. Barbie was introduced yeah. in 1959. Yeah. I don't know how yeah. many young girls play with Barbie anymore. Yeah, they still some do. do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So does that begin, does this whole thing begin in childhood and adolescence? Yes. Well, I think I think it, it does in some respects. I would say that, um, you know, the studies in, in psychology and sociology and, you know, body studies in, in sociology show that increasingly girls and boys are thinking about how they look, 
at younger ages and being, you know, feeling anxiety about how they look, about their appearance. Absolutely. And I think that's kind of connected up with um, also worrying about looking older, right? And that is happening at younger ages. There's a new book out, um, Botox Nation, Changing the Face of America oh, yeah. by a, a wonderful <clears throat> sociologist, Dana Berkowitz. Um, and she talks a lot about how, you know, increasingly those that are getting Botox um, are, you know, in the early 20s, starting even younger. Um, and, and you have to think about it also from the perspective of, um, you know, not to be so cynical about, you know, um, industry, but it is very profitable to frame an intervention as being required over the life course. Because if you get Botox every three to six months and you start at age 20, you're going to be doing that for many, many, many years. And so it's a very um, successful strategy as well from sort of a market perspective in terms of the industry and profits of the industry. But absolutely, I would say that um, that, that, that women are worrying about looking older at younger ages. And, and, and it, it makes sense, right? Because we don't see any models of women growing older naturally in the media, right? And you see, you think about something like the Kardashians, you know, like Kim Kardashian's in her mid-30s now. She's been doing this, you know, this age anti-aging, uh, cosmetic anti-aging maintenance work for years, right? So we're not going to see any signs of aging on her face and body. And I have no reason to think we, we will. We haven't yet. I have no reason to think that, that we will. So you just used a, an interesting word, uh, maintenance, Yes. right? That we're talking now about uh, preventing the appearance of aging as yes. part of the natural maintenance that we have to do to keep ourselves from exactly. looking like we're progressing chronologically. Exactly. Maintenance is one of the buzzwords that's being used in the cosmetic industry right now very, very, very effectively. It's it's very hard to disagree with, with maintenance. <laughs> um, who can disagree with maintenance, right? You, know, you can say, I'm not going to get major work done. I'm just going to have a few, you know, a few tucks here. Um, I'm just going to get a little maintenance, uh, you know, the, the Botox advertising campaign. So, so brilliant. You know, you know, ten, all the ways in which um, they frame it as um, user friendly, accessible, non-threatening, right? You know, just, you know, 10 minutes. Minutes, um, um, you know, in and out at your lunch hour. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Maintenance is a, is a wonderfully effective and very much utilized frame right now in so, the industry. So this sort of generally is a health discussion. Yes. It doesn't seem that psychologically this is healthy. Talk to that. I I would tend to agree with you. I have to, you know, I have to. Um, you know, qualify qualify that with with only with saying that the women that I spoke to who are having cosmetic anti aging interventions um, spoke so eloquently about you know how and why they're having these interventions, and I just want to be mindful and respectful uh -huh. of any one individual's decision to make. Uh, sorry, to have to have intervention, to have these procedures. I don't want to, um, you know, disrespect their decision. And you speak in the book. You speak to both. I do. People I who represent. Are all per, you know both perspectives women so for are, some people it is psychologically healthy it is it increases self-esteem okay. it, it increases their confidence uh, one of the things that I found somewhat discouraging but also speaks to the reality of the intersections of ageism and sexism in our society is that women spoke very eloquently about feeling like they had to look younger um, they had to look physically attractive which they framed as, as youthful looking in order or so that people in their workplace um, people in their um, you know their social circles would take them seriously and would listen to them as individuals. Or so applying like, for a new job. Exactly, but it was almost as though right. for women, um, looking younger, uh, looking physically attractive was sort of um, a, a requirement um, before people would actually listen to what you have to say, right? Before they would actually respect the brain. And that, was, I heard that, that, that would a be lot. different for men. It would be different for men, exactly, absolutely. In the same and yeah, the same data shows that we didn't get a chance to talk about the double standard of aging, um, which is a is a hugely, um, you know, I feel useful concept and something that we see, um, you know, manifest in many different facets of American society. It's a, you know, this gender double standard of aging. But absolutely, I, I I would say as myself as a feminist, I agree with you. I I trouble over the growing normalization of intervention. And it, it makes me sad that women of high stature and high status are also having these procedures and speaking as though they feel like they need to, like it's a no brainer, you know? Um, like Deborah Spar, who's a wonderful feminist scholar who I very much respect, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times um, in the fall a year ago, um, October in New York Times, My Beauty Dilemma. She was the head of Barnard mm. College. Now she's the first woman director of the New York Public Library. And she oh, is wow. getting all these anti-aging procedures and 
talking about it very honestly and troubling over it as a feminist. But for her, she really feels like she has to achieve a youth, youthful aesthetic so that people will take her seriously and read her as somebody who has good ideas um, to contribute, who has um, you know contributions to make in the mental realm. Men don't confront um, those same, I think, um, uh, difficulties, right, um, or those those conflicts in that same yes, way. I think that's very true. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so we're talking about story in the public square. Yes. Is there a public policy yeah. dynamic to these debates? Yeah. I mean, really, cosmetic intervention. These these the, this whole industry is an elective industry. It's it's very unregulated. Um, you know, so one thing you know you know we might say you know the cosmetic industry has really benefited right from our increasingly kind of market based model of medicine right over the last arc um, of um, you know the last bit of the 20th century and into to the 21st century. Um, but I mean you know one ethical I think dilemma that this raises is that because it's so unregulated. You know, people are dying on the operating table. There are all kinds of side effects that people suffer that they weren't expecting to suffer. And there's very little account accountability. You know, Kanye West's of, mom died on the operating table undergoing cosmetic procedures. A lot of procedures not taking place in hospitals, taking oh, place absolutely. in surgical centers. I'm thinking of Joan Rivers, who oh, also died. She died oh, yeah, on, her, yeah. on her plastic aesthetic surgeon's table. Yeah. Yes, she was being operated on to, you know, repair vocal cords. But it was that same, you know, that same arena of medical practice, cosmetic elective practice. There's very little accountability. There's very little regulation, and, and for me, that is an ethical issue. Um, and so, absolutely, I would say, in terms of policy, um, you know, greater regulation of the cosmetic, you know, industry. Um, you know, and it's absolutely true. You can many people. You can go to the mall. And you can get Botox injections. You can go to the local, like in um, in the town in Massachusetts where I spend half my time. There are a few spas right in the downtown. They advertise out on the sidewalk um, this spring. You know, spring is sprung. Time for Botox shots, right? Really? So, oh, absolutely. It's it's everywhere. Really? And think about wow. that. Yeah, the lack of accountability, the lack of regulation. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that is an ethical issue. So we only have uh, about a minute yeah. left. So let me ask you one, just one quick question: yeah. Is this a, u a uniquely American phenomena? Or is this global in, in scope, or Western? What, where, yeah. where do the boundaries lie? Um, it, it is it is a global phenomenon. I mean, increasingly, um, cosmetic procedures, co cosmetic intervention, happening all over the globe. You know, Latin America, Asia, Europe. Um, you know, uh, certain nation states in Africa. Absolutely. Um, I think some of the underlying ideological justification and framing for cosmetic intervention sits really nicely, and actually was fueled by some quint essential aspects of kind of what we think of of what it means to be an American, you know, self-made, you know, proactivity, taking a at fighting aging, taking individual responsibility to make your life better. You know, we see a lot of that framing in the uh, media, in the advertising. Um, but it is a global phenomenon. There are variances, though, I just want to say in terms of what procedures are most popular and why. Huge amounts of, of racialization, racism, sexism that need to be troubled over dependent on context and geography. We gotta leave it there, okay. unfortunately. <laughs> Abigail Brooks, The Ways Women <laughs> Age. That's all the time we have this week, but if you wanna know more about Story in the Public Square, you can visit us on Facebook, Twitter, or PellCenter.org. He's Wayne, I'm Jim. We'll hope to see you next week on Story in the Public Square. <laughs>